There have been times when often I've wondered as I walk this narrow way, would the Lord hear me? Would he answer? Did he even know my name? But I discovered the moment I called him, he is always faithful and true. The answer I need is ready and waiting. By his hand he leads me through. He knows my name and he sees my every need. He picks me up. Praise the Lord, he hears my plea, my blessed hope. And the rock on whom I stand, he knows my name, and he holds my hand. As a weary pilgrim during this journey, I have been in need of strength. So I called the master who's been able to provide whatever I need. There's never a moment he's too busy and won't help me when I pray. He is always willing, ready, and able. Praise the Lord, he knows my name. He knows my name. And he sees my every need. He picks me up. Praise the Lord, he hears my plea, my blessed hope. And the rock on whom I stand, he knows my name, and he holds my hand. He knows my name, and he sees my every need, he picks me up. Praise the Lord, he hears my plea, my blessed hope. And the rock on whom I stand, he knows my name, and he holds my hand. He knows my name, he knows my name, he knows my name, and he holds my hand. Amen. Cindy played My Hope is Jesus on her special with the piano, and then Kylie, he knows my name. And think about, um, he created um, all, he created the stars as if it, if it was an afterthought, and if he knows the name of the stars, he knows my name. And, um, you know, we struggle with remembering people's names, don't we? But God never struggles, and he knows more than just your name. He knows the need on your heart this morning. And as the children are dismissed right now for their service, he knows their needs, and he's going to minister through the teaching of his word to the children, just like he's going to minister to each one of our hearts here in the auditorium. Ephesians chapter 5, if you have your Bibles here this morning, Ephesians chapter 5, we continue in our morning ser series on the book of Ephesians. And uh, in chapter 5, we we've, we've found some really profound and life-changing truths. Uh, we're challenged to be as God is. Of course, we saw that that is only possible, not in our own strength, but uh, as we're yielded and filled with the Spirit of God. Uh, we were also challenged to walk in love, that agape love, that sacrificial, selfless, um, self-serving -ser um, other type of love. We were challenged also to walk in the light, and we saw several passages last week about that. And this morning, um, we're going to look at the truth of walking in wisdom. And, and that, that phrase, walk, is a very familiar phrase in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we're challenged to walk in humility. Later on, we're challenged to walk in unity, Ephesians 4, 4 through 13. Later on in that chapter, the last part of that chapter, to walk in separation from ungodliness, as I mentioned earlier in verses 1 and 2 of Ephesians 5, to walk in love. And now we're looking at walking in wisdom. God desires for us to walk in wisdom. The word wisdom defined in our language means knowledge of what is true or right, coupled with just judgment as to action. 
But a biblical definition of wisdom could be defined as this understanding the will of God as it is revealed in God's word, coupled with the desire to live it out and to obey it by practically applying it in my life. Let me read that again. Uh, Biblical wisdom is understanding the will of God as he reveals it to us in his word, coupled with the desire to live it out and obey it by practically applying God's will in my life. So if I, if I just know what God's word says about a specific matter, but I don't take the next step of having a desire to practically live it out in my life daily, then I have not applied biblical wisdom in my life. I think that's a lot of, lot of, um, a lot of times that's where we fall short as believers. Maybe not the lack of knowledge but the lack of fulfilling, of obeying, of practically applying it in our lives. So this morning, we're going to take a look at some practical ways that you and I can walk in wisdom. Understanding God's will from his word in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15, 16, and 17, and see some practical ways that we can walk in wisdom. Uh, Look at Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17 here. Paul says to the believers of Ephesus, the Holy Spirit says to your heart and my heart this morning, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. First of all, this morning, walking in wisdom, we see that it is a diligent walk. It is a diligent walk. Verse 15 again says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. The word see, we, we were introduced, the first part of that verse, means to look, to consider, to observe. The word circumspectly has the idea of diligence, accuracy, precision. So the command is for us to look, to observe, to consider... Our, our walk diligently, accurately, precisely. Now, I want to take you back a few years. Some of you, you're going way back in your memories. Others of us, it's just a few years. But I want you to think about when you were a child. And some of you are thinking, I can't even remember yesterday. How can I remember back when I was a child? But just use your imagination. And let's say that you've gone to the community playground. And I realize playgrounds nowadays are completely different than years ago. I mean, years ago, it was like a swing, maybe two swings, a teeter-totter, you know, the thing that goes round and round and round and round, and the metal bars, all the contortion that you climb in the maze and everything, and things are a little different now. But I will say this, a little child's imagination has not changed, because I remember when I was a little kid, when I was on that playground, and I want you to think, okay, be honest. Did you ever pretend that the ground was lava on the playground? Anyone? Raise your hand if you be honest. Okay, there, there's just a few of you. The rest of you, you're like, I can't remember back that far. But I have gone to playgrounds now, not to play on, uh, but for my kids when they were younger and, and uh, even at, at a park where maybe we're using the ball field or something, and I could see little kids pretending. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, the ground, you're, you're burning up. You're on lava. And so the little kids, I mean, they're going from from contraption to contraption, and and they're trying to stay off the ground. Because if they touch the ground, they literally believe they are, until mom says it's time to go, then the ground, the lava's gone, and it's okay to to touch the ground. But they're they're being circumspect. They're They're observing, they're taking heed, they're watching every single step. That is the the intensity of that little child's imagination on the playground. That intensity is the intensity that God desires for us as Christians. When it comes to our daily lives, he wants us to take heed, to observe, to consider, to look, to be accurate in the choices and the steps in our walk. Every step we take, we must give diligence. Why? Well, a few reasons. One, if we don't give diligence, if we don't walk circumspectfully, if we're not walking accurately with every step that we take, we'll fall into a trap that our enemy has set before us. 
1 Peter 5, 18 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Our adversary's desire for us as believers is to destroy us, is to cause us to fall into sin. And so he lies in a way ready to attack. James 1.14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The words drawn away there have the idea to lure prey from its hiding place. That's what the real enemy of all of us who know Christ as our personal Savior is trying to do. He's trying to do all he can to activate that sinful flesh that we all still have and to lure us from hiding from a safe safety from a place of safety as we are underneath the submission and the authority of God's word as we're underneath the submission in the home that God has placed us as we're underneath the the authority and we're in submission to the local church that we're a part of and God uses all these authorities in our life for safety but as soon as we We give in to our sinful flesh, and the devil is trying to lure us out from the protection that God has given us and the authority of his word, then we are enticed and we fall into sin. Just like a hunter knows what attracts his prey, if you're hunting deer, I I doubt you're going to bait the deer, and I realize some areas you can't bait deer, but other areas, they bait the deer. And they'll use corn. They'll use apples They don't use dead fish. That's not going to draw the deer in. But just as a hunter knows what is it that will lure the the object of prey that they're trying to hunt and to capture and to kill, so it is a devil. He knows your weakness. He knows mine. And he's actively throwing that out there to try and lure us away. We have a deceitful enemy. And he knows the wickedness of, his heart, of our hearts. And so because of the deceitfulness of our enemy and the wickedness of our hearts, we need to see then that ye walk circumspectly. We need to take great diligence and accuracy into every step that we take. It also says here to walk not as fools, but as wise. You know, this world, and when I say in reference to the world, I'm referencing those who do not know Christ as their personal Savior. If you take time to observe those who are not saved, it's almost as if they're walking around as blind men and women, stumbling, tripping, tripping throughout their life. And it's because they have no light. They have no wisdom, and yet we have been given the light of the Word of God and the light of the Spirit. And so although our enemy is very deceptive, and although our our heart is very wicked and deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Praise God, we have the Spirit of God. We have the light of God's Word to help us with our walk. Every step is important that we take. 1 John 2, 20 through 21, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. With the Word word of God and the Spirit of God, we can, we can uh, perceive, we can understand. You know, that is a trap of Satan. You know what, that is nothing more than my sinful, wicked heart desiring that for my life, and I am going to avoid that. I'm not going to take a step in that direction. I'm not going to make that decision, but I'm going to choose to walk circumspectly, not as a fool, but as wise. What's the purpose of your life? What's the purpose of your walk, of every choice that you make? The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 2.2, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul's purpose, what drove him, was he realized that my walk, the way that I live my life, it will either draw other people to the Lord Jesus Christ, or it will cause people to go away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so one of his purposes was, I want to draw people to Christ, 
And so if I'm going to do that, I'm going to choose to walk in the light. Philippians 1, 20 and 21. According, this is Paul speaking. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now all Christ may be magnified in my body, whether it be life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Not only was his purpose for Christ to be declared to the lost world, but his purpose was also for him to know Christ intimately in great design. And here he says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, that ye take great diligence, heed that your walk is accurate. That's according to a child of God. And a walk is simply one step of a time. That's the Christian life is composed of individual steps in which we must rely upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important. Every step is important because one misstep can be great, can cause great harm to us as individuals. It can cause great harm to the name of Christ. I read of an illustration from Theodore Epp from Ephesians chapter 5, this verse, see then that you walk circumspectly um, as wise, not as fools. Uh, He shared this illustration about how he was in a foreign country and he noticed a surrounding compound of buildings and a wall of brick and stone that had been erected. On top of the wall was toppled with a layer of cement, which in that cement, when it was wet, had been laid pieces of broken glass. The jagged pieces protruded to keep intruders from climbing over the wall. As he was looking at that wall that surrounded the compound, he then noticed a cat on top of that wall, gingerly walking on top where all that broken glass was, but it was making its way across the wall. It was walking carefully. Let me ask you this morning, friend, how's your walk? How was your walk this past week? How was your walk yesterday? Was it circumspectly? Did you consider your adversary the devil? Did you consider when you made that decision, when you took that step, your sinful flesh? Well, I believe it's right. And, and my feelings, I, I, I wouldn't be wrong about this. I just feel so strongly about it. Oh, friend, we need to move beyond our feelings and being feeling-oriented. We need to be based, biblically based and principled upon the truths of God's work. Another thing for us to consider is that a successful walk yesterday does not guarantee a successful walk today. A successful walk is made one step at a time. It also says in verse 5, not as fools but is wise. Theodore Epps says this, the unwise take the path of least resistance, but the wise depend on the Lord to show them the right path. The unwise have their eyes on what is around them while the wise have their eyes on God. The unwise rely on their own wisdom. The wise rely upon Christ's wisdom. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. You know, the wisdom of God is foolishness to this world. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2. But the wisdom of God is only for those that are born again. It's only for those who have spiritual discernment. It's only for the spiritual man. So walking in wisdom, what does that include? Well, from verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fool as wise. We see that that is a diligent walk because we have a deceitful enemy, because we have a desperately wicked heart, and because of the lost around us. We certainly would not want to put a stumbling block before a young believer or the lost that would cause them to go away from the Lord Jesus Christ. So walking in wisdom is a diligent walk. Secondly, from verse 16, we see that walking in wisdom is a discerning walk. It's a discerning walk. Look at verse 16. It says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 
The word redeeming there means to buy up, to deliver from lost. In that time, it was used in the context of purchasing a slave in order to set the slave free. Now, when we're talking about time, it's not necessarily talking about talk, clock time, um, seconds, minutes, and hours. But what it's speaking about is a measured allotment of time. It's talking about your life. And what we need to buy back is our life. You're saying, you know, this upcoming week? Well, that's a part of it. But the whole context is your whole life. Instead of wasting it, instead of living for ourselves, we need to buy back our lives for the cause of Christ. Time is uncertain. Proverbs 21, 27 verse 1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Time is a vapor. James 4, 14, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. We're not guaranteed another 10, 15, 20, 30, 50, 70, 80, go on and on and on, days, years, months, weeks. Uh, just this, this past week, my um, wife got word that um, some of her cousins from Louisiana, they were out on the boat on Saturday, and the driver of the boat um, hit um, some type of a structure in the water. And my wife's 15-year-old cousin went into eternity. 15 years old. The rest of his life ahead of him. But it was gone just like that. When it comes to your life walking in wisdom, we need to have discernment. Because if we just let life unfold before us, we'll waste it. It'll be a waste. One of the greatest sins when it comes to redeeming the time, I believe, is a sin of procrastination. Putting off today, putting off to tomorrow what needs to be done today. And, and when we procrastinate, if you procrastinate in your finances, if you procrastinate in your health, if you procrastinate in your academics, if you procrastinate at work and, oh, the project is due tomorrow and I've had the last three months to get this project done, it's terrible. And many times we and others suffer for it. Instead of procrastinating, we need to redeem the time. In the area of salvation, don't put off getting saved. Don't, don't wait, say, you know what, I'm going to wait till the end of my life. I'm going to live the way I want to live. But if you have been presented with the gospel, and you understand that the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. I'm a sinner, and because of my sin, the wage, the penalty of my sin is death, to be eternally separated from God. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But God loved me, and Christ died for me, was buried and rose again. And if I just put my faith and trust in Christ to save me, he'll save me. I can have eternal life. When I pass from this life, I will go to heaven for all of eternity. That's what the Bible teaches. But there are those who put off. They procrastinate instead of responding when the Holy Spirit speaks to their heart. In Acts chapter 24, verse 25, there was a man by the name of Felix who the apostle Paul was witnessing to. And Felix says, when I have a more convenient season, I'll hear from you. He was reasoning with him according to the scriptures of righteousness, judgment, and temperance. Felix was under conviction, but instead of getting saved, instead of putting his faith and trust in Christ, he says, I'll wait. We don't know if he ever trusted Christ. Most likely not. So if you want to walk in wisdom, walking with discernment, don't procrastinate in the area of salvation. By the way, for believers, don't procrastinate in the area of dealing with sin. If God deals in your heart, he speaks to you about a sin that you have committed or um, a sin that you have not obeyed him in, in a decision that he wants you to make. And he shows that to your heart. Confess that. Don't put it off. 
So many times we find ourselves in a preaching setting, a teaching of God's word, and God speaks to our heart, and the invitation is given, and we put, I'll deal with that later when I get home. God reveals to your heart someone that you need to make something right with. I'll, I'll, you know what, I can do it right now, but you know, I can pick up the phone, and I can call, or I can just say, hey, can we set aside this time to, to, to talk? I want to talk with you about something. Instead of doing that, we put it off. In Genesis chapter 19, Lot has just been told by two messengers of God that God is going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I don't know about you, but if God revealed to me that Catalina, the city of Catalina, or the town, or the community of Catalina was going to be swallowed up tomorrow at 9 a.m., just completely swallowed, and nothing would survive. Um, now, again, this is just an illustration. I'm not predicting this at all. But if God were to come and say that to me, um, I would as quickly load up everything that was of value to me, including my wife and my daughter. We'd have to debate the two dogs and the two rabbits. <laughs> but I have a feeling that they would be coming with us because they're valuable to Kylie. But then I, I would want to get the word out, right? I mean, if, 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 if Kaysen was living somewhere else in Catalina, or if my parents were living on this corner of Catalina, I'd want to let everyone know. These angels said to, to Lot, tomorrow God's going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says, and when they woke, rose up in the morning, it says, and he lingered. The angels had to grab him and his wife and his two daughters by the arms and drag them out of the city. That's how much the wickedness, the sinfulness of the city had gripped their hearts. And friend, don't procrastinate when it comes to dealing with sin. Coming up, preparing for revival, God prepares your heart and he shows you a sin, confess it. If in this service, God speaks to your heart about a sin, I want to encourage you. And even right now, don't wait till the invitation. Ask the Lord right there. Just, just ask the Lord, Lord, you've spoken to my heart about this area of pride, this, this area of unforgiveness. And God, I'm asking you to forgive me. Don't procrastinate. Put off. Redeem the time when it comes to the area of salvation, when it comes to the area of dealing with sin, when it comes to the area of serving Christ. We're full of Christians that have, we're full of churches of people that have good intentions to serve Christ. You know, when I get older, when I get married, when I have children, you know, when my children leave the house, when I'm retired, I, I know you retirees will love this, when I'm retired, I'll have more time. That just doesn't happen, does it? Our lives are so full. In Matthew chapter 8, Christ is talking to so, some who wanted to follow him. And in verse number 18, it says, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandments to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Oh, we're not going to be staying in the Ritz-Carlton? We're not going to be staying at the Hampton Inn? Not even Motel 6 where they leave the light on for you? I have no place to rest? Well, I, 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 maybe some other time, Lord. Verse 20, 21, and another of his disciples said to him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. He wasn't saying, my dad just died, let me go bury him, then I'll follow you. No, what he was saying was, you know, my dad hasn't died yet, but when he dies, let me bury him, and then I'll come follow you. You see, there was something that he wanted to do first before following, before serving the Lord. When it comes to your life and my life, it's a vapor. It's here for a little while and it vanishes away. We have no time to procrastinate, to put off. Serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because we're to redeem the time. Because the days are evil. The Lord has determined the boundaries of our life. 
Job 14, 5, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Job 14, 14, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Psalm 39, 4, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Psalms 104, verse 9, Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, and that they turn not again to cover the earth. God has given each one of us a short window of time here on earth. Will we choose to redeem the time because the days are evil? Will we stop procrastinating, putting off, and start doing what the Lord has us to do? Will we take every opportunity he's given us to live for the Lord and to serve the Lord? Will we take time to pray? Will we take time to worship? Will we take time to share the gospel? Will we take time to read the Bible? Will we take time to walk circumspectly with wisdom, with accuracy, every single step that we take? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Walking in wisdom means that we're walking diligently. We're walking discerning. Then lastly, verse 17, we see that walking in wisdom is a definite walk. It's a definite walk. Verse 17 says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Simply put, unwise means to be ignorant, to be stupid. Does God desire for us to be ignorant or stupid in our lives? No. What does he want us to do? He wants us to understand the will of the Lord. Simple question. Don't answer out loud. Just think, how do you and I understand the will of the Lord? How do we know God's will for our lives? He's given it to us, right? His word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Walking in wisdom means walking with direction. I'm not going to walk ignorantly blindly, stupidly, by my own feelings or by the pressures of this world that are trying to fashion me and conform me to its will. I'm going to understand what God's word says, the will of the Lord. How do we do that? It's by being in his word. I, I, I shared in a message on Wednesday night, we're doing the, for the next two Wednesday nights after this past Wednesday night, a messages in preparing our hearts for revival. And, and we're, we're talking about, um, we're using several words to help us, and, and the word for Wednesday night was stop. And the first point was stop rushing. We're too busy. And sometimes our lives are so filled with even good things, and Satan understands, you know, if I can just get them so busy, with good things, even serving others. If I can get them so busy, they won't have time to stop and to listen, to read, and to hear that sweet, still, small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to their hearts. And so when we fill our lives and our schedules are so busy, we're frantically going from one good thing to the next good thing. We fail to understand the will of the Lord. We fail to understand that instead of, yes, there's a place for serving, but instead of being so focused on serving like Martha, we need to be focused at the feet of Jesus like Mary was. Am I willing to slow down? Am I willing to allow the Spirit to speak to me? God's word is without error. God's word is inspired and eternal. It's food for our souls. 
when we read the word of God, it reveals to us the very mind of God himself. You know, when we are spending time in God's word and we're meditating upon God's word, other people can see it. They'll see it by your countenance. They'll hear it in your response with your words. They'll see it in your response, in your actions, in the direction, the steps that you take. And so it is our ignorance of God's word is very quickly revealed. This morning as I was driving to church, I um, usually uh, have turn on the, the radio when I'm driving, and I'll, and I'll listen to different stations. Sometimes I just press the, depends on which vehicle I'm in, but if I'm in Kaysen's Vibe like I was this morning, I'll press the seek. And so I, 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 very, I didn't want to hear the health talk on the station I was on, so I pressed seek, and I, oh, this is a, a religious station. So I started listening. And um, I was like, oh, I, I, I just listened for a few minutes. But the person who was talking was it was he was concluding his message and then he was talking about this phrase of why God loves America and wh- why God has a desire to bless America and this was his basis he says if you take the the name Jerusalem we all know that Jerusalem God loves Jerusalem from the scriptures well you take the word Jerusalem and right in the middle of it you see the word you see the letters U S A And he says, God loves the U-S-A. And I was thinking, from from a word, Jerusalem, you get God loves U-S-A? Now, the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach. To any people. As I started off in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if my people, which are called by my names, my name shall humble themselves and shall confess their sins and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven, then will I forgive their sins, then will I heal their land. You know, sometimes people talk religious. And and again, I just heard, and there may have been some other nuggets out there that were based upon the scriptures, but I just couldn't help but think. Okay, to me, that's not walking with discernment. But there's people that will take codes, they'll take words, and they'll change them around, and they'll, they'll get direction for their life from that. When God desires for us to take his word that he's given us and to use it for our lives, knowing, submitting, and obeying his word gives us peace and strength and help, and hope. As it says in verse 17, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, stupid, but understanding the will of the Lord. What is my relationship to this word? Is it a one day a week relationship? Is it just a hurry up early in the morning, open it up? And, and get something so I can check off my list? Or am I stopping and taking the time for God to speak? Walking in wisdom. It's walking diligently. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. It's walking with direction, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And it's walking with direction and purpose, understanding what the will of the Lord is. How is your walk this morning? Let's bow for prayer. God, I I thank you for the passage from Ephesians chapter 5. I thank you for the challenge for walking in wisdom. And God, I pray that you help each and every one of us to be diligent, to have discernment, and to have direction in our walk. God, help us not to allow the time of life that you've given us to be wasted. But help us to buy it back. Help us to redeem it for all of eternity. God, if there's one underneath the sound of my voice that is not saved, I pray that they wouldn't put off getting saved today, but that they choose to trust you as their personal Savior. 
God, if there's one who has been convicted of sin in their life, may they not put it off, but may they confess and forsake that sin and find mercy and grace and help in their time of need. And God, if there's one that's struggling with serving you in an area that they know you've called them to and you desire for them to step out and to be faithful and and to serve you to redeem that time, I pray that they take that step. Father, whatever step we need to take this morning, may we accept your grace to take it, I pray in Christ's name. With our heads still bowed and our eyes closed, just a few questions this morning. First of all, would there be anyone here this morning that would say, Pastor Kramer, I don't know about this whole walking thing, and I didn't know about a lot of what you said, but when you were talking about salvation and not putting off being saved, and you mentioned again the gospel very briefly, but I, I've been putting that off. I've been making all sorts of excuses, but today I realize that today I need to trust Christ as my personal Savior. If that's you, right where you're seated, no, no one else is looking around, but I would just like, and I won't call you out by name, but I would just like to pray for you. Would there be anyone that would say this morning, Pastor, I'm not saved, and I'm not putting it off anymore. This morning, before I leave, I'm going to trust Christ as my Savior. I'm going to redeem the time. I'm going to get it settled today, or I've just been struggling with doubts about my salvation, and I'm going to take care of it today before I leave. Could you raise your hand right where you're at and put it back down? I'm not saved, but I want to get it taken care of today. Okay. Secondly, when it comes to the area of just being right with God, uh, there's a specific sin that God has spoken to my heart about, and, and he's spoken to it in the past, and he brought it up again this morning. It wasn't even mentioned. It didn't have to be mentioned because God spoke to my heart about it, and I want to redeem the time. I want to walk with discernment. I want to buy back the time. And I'm confessing, I've already confessed it, or I'm confessing that right now in this time of invitation, God spoke to my heart. Could you raise your hand as a testimony to that? Good. Good. How many would say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart about an area of serving him? My life, I I look back and I just haven't, I haven't used it for eternity. My life has been so purposeless It's been been about serving myself and not serving Christ. It's been about pleasing myself and not drawing others to Lord Jesus Christ. But God has spoke to my heart about the area of serving him. And I'm making that decision this morning. Could you raise your hand and put it back down? Good. Father, I pray that you would continue to work in hearts. And as we have this time of invitation, would no one delay but would all who have you spoken to their hearts, would they respond? Either they're at your seat, their seat praying, or down here at an altar, or praying with someone else, Father, may they make that decision. May all of us make the decision to walk in wisdom. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together, heads bowed, eyes closed, as the piano softly plays. Would you respond as God's spoken to your heart? You can pray there at your seat, come down to an altar. I'd be happy to pray with you if you'd like someone to pray with. But as the piano plays, would you respond as God has spoken to your heart?
you could look right here. Um, in just a moment, Brother uh, Bob Hill, I'm going to ask you to dismiss us in a word of prayer. But just a few reminders tonight, our service is at 6 p.m., followed by the business meeting. If you wanted a copy of um, the information for the meeting tonight, I'll have that at the back door as you leave. And um, I just want to encourage each and every one of you, um, every single day, um, we have the choice to walk in wisdom. And I pray that you'll, you'll take that, that um, challenge from God's word from Ephesians chapter 5 this morning and apply it. Uh, thank you again so much for coming. Avery, it's good to have you this morning. I hope that you'll come back and visit us again. Um, Lord bless you. Brother Bob, if you could dismiss us in a word of prayer, please.